lame, my back lame, my hands, neck, and shoulders sore and chafed. But boys, there is a golden glimmer in the distance, which grows plainer each mile traveled. After nine miles of climbing, sheep camp. Last year, it was washed away by a killer flood. Now, it is the scene of a human tidal wave. In early April, native porters abandoned the trail, declaring the melting snows unstable. The overeager stampeders ignore the warnings. John Dewey is a witness to the disaster that follows. April 3rd, 1898. This morning after breakfast, we heard the rumble above us and rushed out and watched a genuine avalanche. No one knows how many are dead and buried. Probably somewhere between 40 and 100. Hundreds are trapped beneath 30 feet of snow. Many are dug out, but 63 die. But greed is stronger than fear. 22,000 continue upward. The summit is still four miles away. The 30-degree slope far too steep for dogs or horses. Professional porters demand a dollar a pound. It is a price that many cannot meet. They turn back, defeated. For those who can afford to carry on, more agony. A stairway stretches 500 feet to the summit. 1,200 icy steps. It was not game to groan, but purple faces and lungs gasping for more power for bodies quivering with excess of strain told of misery that was felt if not expressed. When a man did break down, he collapsed utterly, and sometimes he wept. On the crest were piled hundreds of pilgrims' outfits, separated from one another by narrow paths, making the whole seem like a city in miniature. The stampeders dump their loads at the summit, and then head down for more. An ordeal repeated until many have walked a total of 2,000 miles. Then, inspection at the Canadian border. Anyone without enough food is sent back. A crushing fate after weeks of climbing. Most are passed through to begin the descent to the lakes. Back in the Klondike gold fields, miners begin to examine the mountains of dirt hauled up during the winter. The miners wash the frozen soil, loading it into sluices. The heavier gold falls into the cracks, while the lighter dirt is washed away. For many miners, the sluicing results in heartbreak. But a few enjoy a golden spring. 
Belinda Mulroney is one of the biggest winners. The claims she purchased over the winter proved to be among the richest in the Klondike. The former steamship stewardess is now a woman of wealth. Now the Yukon River awaits 20,000 more would-be millionaires. By May of 1898, their tents line the shores of Lakes Bennett and Lindemann, and the hills have been stripped of the timber needed to build 7,000 boats. Finally, on May 29th, the flotilla sets off, carrying the golden hopes of 20,000 souls. But few of the 20,000 have ever steered a boat on flat water, let alone the Yukon Rapids. May 31st, 1898, lakes open. A report comes up from Whitehorse Rapids that of the first 170 boats through, 40 were lost. John Dewey. Sam Steele of the Mounties orders that all boats be guided by experienced pilots. The ruling saves dozens of lives. But as the boats approach Dawson, temperatures suddenly vault into the 90s, hatching clouds of mosquitoes. Yet the stampeders sail onward. In early June, as the first of the 20,000 haul themselves ashore in Dawson, Tappan Adney is an eyewitness. The newcomers continue to pour in. Each said that the crowd was behind him. Their tents cover the hillside. <laughs> it is a motley throng gathered from every corner of the earth. Weather-beaten, sunburned, Japanese, Negroes. <laughs> the newly rich Belinda Mulrooney opens the Fairview, Dawson's most elegant hotel. Its chandeliers and linens have been hauled up the White Pass. Mulrooney is the queen of Yukon society. By July, Dawson can equal the opulence of many southern ports. There is fresh seafood, even a bowling alley. At the casinos, fortunes are scored and squandered in seconds. Tables are open 24 hours a day, though closed on Sundays. Poker-faced millionaires wager up to $50,000 on the turn of a single car. This fantastic wealth has come from the creek beds staked out in the past two years. But by the summer of 1898, little is left for the newcomers. Scores of men will find themselves working for wages, just like back home. It no longer takes just a tin pan and a shovel to become a Klondike millionaire. 
With all the streams already staked, miners walk 50 and 60 miles into the wilderness. But few find anything but failure. Many spend three days in line, waiting to register their claims, only to be usurped by cheaters who bribe their way inside. Many decide simply to give up and go home. Among them is Becky Schuldenfry. The steamers sell cheap tickets home, so Becky leaves. Saul remains for one last hopeful winter. By the end of August, 7,000 people, one third of the dreamers, are headed home. For them, the Klondike is a place where the poor labor for the rich, just like where they came from. Most have gained no wealth, no millions, but they take home the knowledge that they have survived the adventure of a lifetime. They have gambled their lives on a dream of gold, and all of them are richer for the quest. In a few short seasons of frenzy, the Klondike yields $50 million worth of gold. But the Stampeders have spent almost the same amount to get there. Journalist Tappan Adney sails on the last steamer out of Dawson in 1898. Later, he settles in New Brunswick, Canada, and becomes known for his writings on canoeing. Saul Schuldenfry makes a small strike, but his profits are wiped out by a fire and the cost of digging out his claim. He returns to his wife, Becky, in 1899, a poor tailor once more. Belinda Mulrooney marries a certain Count Carbonneau, who claims to be a champagne salesman from Paris. In fact, the Count is a barber from Montreal. After her divorce, she moves to Yakima, Washington, with her Klondike gold. The late summer of 1899 brings a twist. Another golden bonanza on the sands of Nome, Alaska. Thousands of stampeders head across the U.S. border, their ambitions reborn. Today, there is still gold to be found in the Klondike. Most is taken out by modern machines, while a few solitary prospectors still search for the glint of riches. For them, as for the stampeders of a century ago, the lure is the same, the glimmer of gold. 